to a new conversation organized this time jointly by the European Training Foundation and the International Training Center of the International Labor Organization. Today's conversation, again, under the Learning Connect branding, is about a key topic, digital inclusion, sharing priorities, making it real. And it's great to have you all back and stay with us for the next hour. Just a little introduction. Today's conversation is part of the ETF's communication campaign about digital skills for inclusion, which takes place for the whole month of January. But this is not all. As I said, this conversation is organized jointly with the ITC ILO, which in July 2021 hosted a digital inclusion summit. And this will be at the center of today's conversation. And indeed, uh, we are here because digitalization and digital inclusion are high in the international agenda and more and more part of our lives. This is a digital discussion. And what does digital inclusion mean in practice? Why is it relevant to discuss? about it and how are institutions cooperating to improve inclusion through digital in the developing countries? And what are the plans for the future? So a number of questions and I'm already very curious to uh, get uh, to know more about the answers. So let me introduce right away the distinguished guest speakers of today's discussion. So, ladies first, Karin Sonigo, so Skills Digitalization Specialist at the ILO. Thanks, Karin, for being with us. Thanks for having me and good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon, Karin. And also thanks to Tom Wambeke, Chief Learning Innovation at ITC ILO. Thank you, Tom. Hello, good afternoon. Happy to be here. Thank you for being with us, Tom. And my colleague, Fabio Nascimbeni, Human Capital Development Expert at the European Training Foundation. Thank you for being with us, Fabio. Thank you, and good afternoon or morning. And before we get started, we'd like to invite you, wherever you are, and who are following us live on all platforms from Twitter to LinkedIn to Facebook to YouTube to let us know where you're watching from, say hi and be ready to send questions. And also very big news for today, a surprise because there is a little competition and a little game for you all with a nice prize to win. So stay tuned for the next hour and take part in the conversation. But now let's go straight to the business. And uh, Tom, I'd like to start with you because um, at the... If you I'm sorry, Tom, if you can keep your mute until I close the question, apologies, but uh, I know that one of the tips is dealing with um, <laughs> technical issues, and now I'll explain why these tips are, are, are relevant. Because, Tom, at the Digital Inclusion Summit in July last year, you explored, mixed, and shook up four radical ideas about what digital inclusion means for lifelong learning and which led to the creation indeed of 42 tips to make digital inclusion a reality. Um, can you share with us some of these secrets, maybe starting from the one I have just flagged? Tom. First, I have to unmute myself because usually that would go into the technical error that you're all shouting to me, please unmute yourself. So that error I did not make. So secrets, yeah, it's not really about secrets i would say i think the, the nice thing and it's indeed already six months ago that we had this summit but the whole idea was to bring different actors together into a kind of interdisciplinary dialogue there's a lot of actors and stakeholders really concerned and passionate with the topic of digital uh, inclusion i mean we had uh, delegates from all kinds of stakeholders we had unesco there itu colleagues from ilo delegates working at the policy level, but also delegates working at, let's say, the grassroots level. And I thought that was the interesting way to see when you have this kind of interdisciplinary dialogue that tries to move beyond technological solutionism, as we have mentioned it in the publication, that's actually a very interesting crossroad where inclusion and innovation can, can meet each other. And that resulted in about 42 of these different tips you were speaking about 
four radical uh, areas. Actually, I think it was Fabio that introduced before the thing we should talk about radical inclusion. And I asked him why radical inclusion. And he reminded me that that was one of the original principles of that famous Burning Man festival somewhere in the States. It's based upon 10 principles. And I said, of course, we are not a festival, but we're also inspired by principles. Actually, the principles that drive us towards these secrets are the principles of digital development when we talk about digital inclusion. But if you look at these principles of digital development, there's nowhere a center point for radical uh, inclusion. Of course, there's user-centered design, human-centered design, and all so on. And this kind of radical inclusion was a kind of a good um, entry point. When you mentioned these four areas there, it's about reimagining digital literacy, it's about advancing the agenda of 360 degrees inclusion, it's about designing for humans, and it's also about accelerating momentum. These are not four recipes, these were just four clusters of ideas that emerged from the more than 100 participants that we basically thematically oriented these kind of uh, areas. And what was nice, I think that the interdisciplinary dialogue led to a kind of a, a common sense view of things that are understandable because usually you have these discussions in your own expert area and they might seem very technical, whether we talk about infrastructure, software, skills, or whatever dimension of the whole discussion is there, it's rather technical. <clears throat> when we bring them together, <clears throat> into a more holistic view, you see these kind of 42 tips. If you look at it, there's none of them that you would say, I really did not know them. And so that's the idea where it really becomes, uh, let's say, really uh, accessible. So um, I will, throughout the conversation, maybe point out to a few of these uh, tips to, to illustrate uh, that maybe just picking one uh, out of it. I think I wrote two of them down. Um, I think one of them is definitely, and I think also Fabio has mentioned it more, tip 30. It's really more about changing, uh, let's say, it's not talking about the software or the hardware, it's really talking about the human mindware. And that's where we said we don't need to focus on technological headsets, but really on rather changing mindsets. And you will see throughout, let's say, the 42 tips for digital inclusion that are out there, it's really a moment in this kind of fast food information society to reflect upon each uh, out of each one of these 42 different uh, tips and that creates also a little bit of moment of conversation and reflection because each tip is not just a recipe or a kind of a, a top to-do list that you need to do but it's really accompanied also a bit of kind of an artistic work that helps you to think out of the box and maybe find more meanings in the different tips in order to actually foster a digital inclusive uh, future. So it's like open for interpretation. Why do we have 42 tips? I don't know, it's a question mark. I recommend everybody to read the book, The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, to find an answer on that one. So that's it more or less in a nutshell. It's not secrets, it's really going for inspiration. It's going for a little bit of intentional serendipity and do the things in a non-usual way, which is our initial interpretation of uh, radical uh, inclusion. Thank you very much, Tom. And uh, indeed, we can consider this as a participatory process, an ongoing process. And in the next round of questions, our followers will know better why uh, they can also have a say on the 42 tips, uh, which maybe one day can become 43, 44, who knows. Uh, before um, giving the floor to the next speakers, just give me, please, a second to go through the overwhelming and nicely overwhelming messages which we've received from our followers to uh, say some hi back to Inesh, to Anjuman, to Gabriela from Romania, James from UK, Susanna from Macedonia, Sofia from Tunisia, um, uh, someone from Greece, Amin from Algeria, we have Myanmar, Italy, Finland, Pakistan, Libya, Portugal. Uh, thank you so much for, for being with us. Please uh, keep on letting us know where you are from and start thinking about uh, what your ideas will be to make uh, digital inclusion a reality. Now, let's go uh, to uh, Karin, Karin Soningo. Uh, over uh, 100 individuals from UN organizations, 
NGOs and the private sector that are contributing towards digital inclusion participated in this summit. And why do you think such a, a great interest on, on digital inclusion is there from such a variety of actors? Karin, over to you. Thank you very much, Daria. Um, well, uh, in your question, there's both digital and inclusion. And I think that this growing interest is based on this growing awareness uh, that digitalization and the use of technologies in general um, um, is having an impact on both our lives and, and in, 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 in our uh, workplaces. And um, there's, of course, an impact on and, it, and it's driving as all the mega trends such as, you know, climate change and, 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 um, and, and demographics, for example. They are driving new skills uh, 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 that are demanded and needed for individuals to be able to thrive in the digital economies and societies as well. I mean, um, services such as health, um, finance or administration are uh, now accessible online for some of them. And so individuals in their own daily lives also need to be you know, able to access those, uh, those services. So I think that there's this, this growing awareness uh, and, and therefore interest on the digital aspect of, of your question. And it's not only you know, located in some areas, countries or, or, or regions. It's global. I mean, it's really uh, raising uh, interest on uh, on the part of the international community because it's a global global phenomenon. So that's one thing I think, which you know makes it uh, uh, of of a real interest from the international community. The other aspect is the, the inclusion uh, part of it, and. I should say that inclusion is, uh, as as Tom mentioned, um, is the a uh, human-centered or user-centric approach uh, that we have to a topic. And here we're talking about digitalization and use of technologies in the workplace and in the learning space. And um, in order to you know, include everyone or not to further exclude individuals, we definitely need to have this you know, user-centric approach to uh, skills development, to uh, workplace and to uh, um, um, yeah, career management in general. Now, um, the COVID-19 pandemic um, that we are all going through uh, more or less still uh, in different countries, but the COVID-19 pandemic brought to the fore those inequalities and, and this digital divide that pre-existed the, the COVID-19 pandemic, but that, you know, uh, exacerbated it. And we saw that access to technologies is definitely uh, unequal depending on where you are located uh, uh, throughout the world. And we should, and, and what was, is that uh, during the pandemic, there was some kind of, you know, panic responses or short-term responses to go online because of the urgency and, and distancing measures that we all had to, to be facing with. And now it's, it's time to, you know, try to, take a step backward and have a more long-term strategic approach, which is one that it's more based on needs assessments, needs rather than solutions, uh, uh, to have a more strategic approach to the use of technologies. And we should definitely be using technology not because of the sake of using it, not because it's trendy or because you know other people or other companies or other countries do it but only because it will simplify, for example, the learning experience and not complexify it, you know, taking learners to X number of platforms to go through courses. Um, we should use it only if it enhanced the integration of working and learning in the workplace, for example. We should use it only if it gives the possibility to people with disabilities, for example, to access learning opportunities or even work opportunities that they would not have access to uh, in other circumstances. Um, we should only use it if it um, allows to revamp, rethink um, 
um, simplify processes uh, thanks to data, for example, that we use out of technology and so on and so forth. So again, um, I think that the, the international community has a raising uh, interest on both digital and digital inclusion as a whole to make sure that we use technology for good and that we leverage technology and make the best out of it uh, for uh, seeing it as a means, if I can put it like that, and not as a goal per se. Um, so yeah, I think that that's the, the, the increasing awareness on both, you know, digital and then technology's impact and the fact that it has the potential to uh, increase inequalities that that uh, um, brought that, uh, you know, increased interest uh, around digital inclusion. Lastly, thank you, Daria. Thank you very much, uh, Karine, for uh, bringing uh, to the discussion a, a number of uh, very uh, thought provoking points. Uh, also, Karine, you, you flagged uh, the uh, impact uh, on on learning and uh, going to to uh, Fabio Nascimbeni, um, the European Training Foundation is committed at improving lifelong learning systems in EU neighboring countries and actively contributed to the Digital Inclusion Summit and is working closely with the ITC ILO to make it a reality. So which were the tips that uh, the ETF brought to the table, Fabio, and why are they essential to inclusion in transition countries? Over to you. Thank you, thank you. Well, actually, it's uh, it has been an interesting journey what we did uh, together during the summit and uh, actually, during the summit, I think we learned uh, uh, in terms of a general, uh, a general tip is that digital inclusion uh, is, is not a new concept. I remember in uh, 2003, the United Nations organized the World Summit on Information Society. And these are were almost 20 years ago. And if you look at the, at the buzzwords used in that summit and in our summit, for as much as we tried to escape from these buzzwords, the concepts are the same. Because actually, as, as Karin was saying, they, the issue is the one of social inclusion. Digital is a mean. We need to include people in learning, in lifelong learning, in, in better work, and so on. And so actually, what we, what we, we brought, uh, I think, uh, not only through a specific session we had on, uh, on uh, TVET, but also throughout the summit, was this attention on the contribution of technology to lifelong learning when the conditions are in place, when the inclusive conditions are in place, actually. So the, the, the macro question, which was uh, in the virtual summit room all the time, is what has changed in the last 20 years if we look at digital inclusion? Because technology has changed dramatically. 20 years ago, there was no Facebook. There was nothing like that. At the same time, the approach has changed also quite a lot. Now we hear more and more speaking about the human side of inclusion, the human side of technology and so on. And so what can we do now to really advance the agenda? We, we, can, we can decide we can, that we can incrementally go on and we, we, we've, we've seen that the number of countries, uh, also the countries we work with at ETF are actually progressing quite strongly. But is it possible, that was the main question at the summit, is it possible to really come up with some idea that can advance the agenda? Uh, in a lifelong learning perspective, of course, we're talking about inclusion for lifelong learning and for 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 learning in general. And so I think uh, now I, I I remember in the in the great conclusions about the, in the summit. Uh, I think it was Tim Manuin uh, who was actually also at the World Summit. He was mentioning a few things. I remember the fact that now it it might be the time of being a bit more radical than before. Actually, so we could uh, really. We could really see the famous slogan uh, leaving no one behind as a possibility when it comes to digital inclusion it's not just a matter of uh, you know a, an impossible um, uh, objective long-term objective it is possible to include everybody if we do the right choices uh, in uh, in technology terms then of course uh, the, it was said already this uh, switch switch from uh, the technology to the user of the technology now i i think uh, in many cases, connectivity, not in all cases, unfortunately, but, but in many cases, connectivity is no more the problem. It is sometimes part of the problem. But now, even in cases when you when you have connectivity, 
and you have access and even a good quality access in many cases you see access is not and use is not meaningful so and that depends on the human on the user not on the technology not on the connection and the third uh, what what uh, karin was saying is uh, can we really have now a, a future oriented look because now we should be talking and we started to talk about this in the summit not so much about the technology of today artificial intelligence is there is there to stay of course uh, but the metaverse is coming so how sh how can we how can we start thinking and start acting to make sure that the metaverse will be an inclusive place for example if such a thing will ever exist or whatever it will be any new thing any new course any new uh, ebook any new whatever learning journey that's also what uh, I learned at the summit that what is actually guiding our work now should be designed in an inclusive way from the very beginning. That's the key. I mean, if you if you try to patch things later on, okay, that we have a nice course, but we have not enough uh, female uh, learners. Let's increase that. That doesn't work. You know, you need to you need to start thinking from the very beginning to all the different dimensions of uh, of inclusion and of digital inclusion. And uh, being gender, being the rural urban uh, dynamic, uh, being the whatever disabilities is a very big issue. You know, you can uh, we can have the metaverse, but if we exclude people with disability from that, it's uh, it's exclusive. It's not inclusive. So actually, I think we brought some of these discussions, this discussion point on the table. But actually, I think we learned more than we than we actually brought there. And the summit was a really, a, in my my experience. Uh, it was a moment where we tried all together to bring forward the agenda now. And I, th I see this dynamic, this positive dynamic of uh, an agenda which is changing and actually becoming more contemporary. So that's my take for now. Thank you very much. Um, thank you very much, Fabio. Design in an inclusive way from the very beginning. Now, I think that uh, maybe it would be also interesting um, to, uh, to know from our audience if they've ever uh, started developing projects with, uh, with this way of working uh, by, by thinking about placing inclusion at, at the very core and at the very origin of the um, design uh, of new projects and activities. I see that there are a number of comments and questions coming up. Uh, please keep on doing so. Uh, we'll take them on board uh, in the second round of questions because I'd like to go back to um, Karin um, uh, following up to what Fabio just said because Karin you are an expert in uh, skills utilization and uh, digital inclusion as it was flagged by the digital inclusion digital summit uh, uh, report is uh, directly uh, linked to the evolution of uh, inclusive uh, uh, learning. So what does it mean in concrete terms? And is this something that countries can realistically achieve? What are the tools available, Karin? Thank you, Daria. Um, so yeah, uh, inclusive learning, uh, again, as uh, Fabio also pointed out, and, and I, I also mentioned, um, is definitely uh, having or putting people at the center, like, beneficiaries of any skills development opportunity and from the earlier stages of, of design uh, right before you know implementing anything and have the different stakeholders have targeted groups uh, uh, included in this design uh, design thinking or design approaches where um, different targeted groups are being included to make sure that we are not excluding anyone in the design so that's one thing um, more and more, we uh, look at learning as a service. So we should definitely be, you know, client, if I can put it like that, oriented or user uh, oriented to make sure that we include everyone who is going to be benefiting from this skills development opportunity. Other than, uh, for, in order to have inclusive learning, uh, other than, you know, making sure that we are designing learning and skills development offers, content, courses that are, that can be accessed by all. And in that respect, as we said, include them in a design from scratch, but also have targeted policies for specific targeted, more or less vulnerable groups, such as youth, such as elderly, uh, women, uh, migrant workers, and, and, and 
people with disabilities and other more vulnerable groups. We should also look at um, how to make uh, learning or learning experiences or learning content and courses as relevant as possible. And in that matter, um, we need to make sure that uh, content that is being developed is updated and aligned with the demand of the labor market. So um, maintenance, or if I can put it like that, update of curricula in terms of you know, what they are covering are aligned with labor market information and labor market needs in terms of the demand to make sure that anybody who is going through a learning experience, a course, a skills development opportunity, um, we are focusing on the learning outcomes and what it will bring uh, in terms of job opportunities, for example. Another aspect uh, in terms of um, learning inclu inclusivity or, or inclusive learning is the, um, the fact that thanks to technology, a lot of content is available online, whether that be free of charge or uh, licensing uh, uh, based or based on, yeah, sorry, uh, licenses. Um, but in some of the case, those off the shelf content uh, are being produced or designed or conceived by um, international companies and providers and available uh, in English as a, as a native language with sometimes poor translation and some cultural guesses. And so when you are uh, in Ukraine or in Nigeria, for example, and you'd like to be using those potentially free of charge or licensed uh, content for your own purposes, it's sometimes difficult because they are not relevant, not adapted to the local specificities, whether that be language, culture, uh, or uh, labor market specificities. So that's another thing that I think is uh, critical to be looking at content-wise to make sure that we definitely deliver and design uh, um, uh, inclusive learning, as we call it. Um, the way you deliver content is also uh, should also be appropriate. And again, technologies for the sake of technology, definitely not. We should be looking at who we are targeting and the, the, the possibilities, the constraints uh, that people have to make sure that we should be using this or that modality and this or that tool. Um, another thing that I have on, on top of my head is um, of course, accessibility. Uh, uh, so, you know, whenever we are leveraging technology, uh, um, uh, we need to make sure that, uh, as Fabio said, people with disabilities can uh, rely on um, some kind of assistive technologies to make sure that they are not excluded from the learning uh, process as well, and that they can rely on specific software to make sure that they have access to those learning opportunities as others do. So. I would say that all of those aspects that I've just mentioned are part of um, what I call design and delivery of learning opportunities. And that's, to me, only one aspect of all of the stages that any individual goes through when he or her will go through a learning opportunity. It's part of is, you know, learning to earning, as we sometimes hear it, uh, mm -hmm. pathway uh, where you are identifying the skills you, you already have, the experience you have, the skills that you may need to, to go to a different uh, uh, um, uh, occupation or position, uh, the learning offer that you might want to go to, to be able to, you know, to go to this new occupation, and then the job opportunities. So I think countries uh, should definitely take this more, you know, uh, global perspective and integrated approach and not you know look at learning as a, a you know a sole area of design and delivery of learning opportunities but really look at it at a, a, a more um yeah um, global or, or integrated pathway of each individual in a lifelong learning perspective as as um, as fabio was mentioning as well um so yeah um yeah, um, yeah, that's my take for now, uh, Daria. Thank you. Thank you very much, Karin. Uh, I didn't mean to interrupt you, uh, in, but uh, I think that um, many of the points that uh, you flagged, as well as uh, the points that uh, Tom and Fabio have just flagged, have raised a number of um, of uh, comments and questions. 
So what I propose is that since we are speaking about uh, digital and talking about digital inclusion, we have to be inclusive. Uh, and uh, uh, from, um, I will change a bit the, the flow of our conversation, if you don't mind. So I suggest that we go now to the chat and go a bit through um, some of the insightful comments we've received from our participants. And then, dear followers, stay there because the competition on the next tips uh, is just around the corner. And we'll have that with Tom in a few seconds, a uh, few minutes from now. So um, I see a, a comment uh, from... Camille Kamal Jabr, uh, who is flying in, we used to use the concept of digital gap between North and South, but now the digital exclusion is widely spread. The sustainable solution depends on the policies adopted and the official support. Um, thank you, Kamal, for uh, flagging. Um, there is linked to this um, geographic area, there is a question to Fabio. Uh, for ETF, what are the practical options for implementing digital inclusion projects in southern countries? Have you proposed a practical solution for southern countries, Fabio? Well, uh, the, the, the short answer is we are working on that, actually from the south, uh, from the south med, uh, but also from the other countries and regions we, we work with, we receive a lot of uh, of course, requests uh, in this specific field. I can just mention uh, uh, Jordan, Egypt, but also you know Turkey, Israel. Uh, in, there is a lot of uh, there is a lot of interest and a lot. I would say of also of uh, honest willingness to learn by policymakers because uh, COVID has shown that things cannot go on as before. I mean, we are the the the, the three of us, the three speakers, we are speaking from our home. So we are, for example, we are responsible for our connection. You know, it, it, this, these small things change, uh, you know, a lot the, the ecosystem, to make an example. So actually, what we, we, what we decide is not to have a specific initiative or a project on digital inclusion, because this would be reductive, uh, thinking of the holistic view that we are preaching, but actually to, <clears throat> to put digital inclusion together with digitalization and digital transition, as the European Commission says, as a necessary dimension in all the digital activities and all the activities in support of our uh, countries we do. So just to make an example, we are working to finalize uh, what we are calling now the, uh, the framework for digital education reform, where we basically are trying to understand which were the most successful, and there was a question by a Romanian uh, participant on what can be done, you know, to, to, to improve actually the, the, the capacity of a country to be more inclusive through technology. So we are looking at successful policies, not only from Europe, but from everywhere, and especially from transition countries. And we are trying to uh, divide these policies in different areas, because actually for as holistic as we want to be, the, the concept, the, the, the theme is pretty, is pretty complex. And so the areas are many, you know, we have content, you have skills, uh, you have pedagogies, uh, plenty of different areas. And in each one of these, uh, we are looking specifically for the inclusive uh, leverage. So if you look at content, for example, uh, online learning resources, we have many ways, but that's, that's a, specific, a specific area where by, for example, simply allowing translation to other languages, and I'm talking, for example, of open educational resources, with just one decision, you can make a resource potentially available to everybody. If you don't allow that with a, as, as a government, as the owner of that resource, that road is closed. So we are looking now for these smart solutions in every single activity we do, of course, in the digitalization field, but it's uh, which is becoming bigger and bigger. And so I would say uh, not specifically from uh, from the south, but for all the countries we work at and uh, we work with, we are actually trying to to look for these uh, for these uh, mini leverages or, or important leverages. And this uh, we will be publishing the the first draft. We would like to publish it in a draft version to get comments by audience like this one. And, so to, to try to understand actually what are the smart choices and the, again, the radical choices, the, the bold decisions that governments could make to really transform a 
innovative, effective, fancy technology solution that we might want to, to, to use, even coming from the private sector, because I'm not saying that it should all be public. I mean, private sector has the right to be there, but of course, the, the public sector has the right, I would say, and the obligation to make sure that uh, there is, again, uh, that these leverages are taken into account, that uh, we know and policymakers should know that uh, there, every time you make a decision about any digital technology, you have a continuum which goes from total inclusion, radical inclusion, to exclusion. And you need to know that and to decide where to position yourself. And that's a policy choice. And that's what we are trying to instill in all our, our policy advice actions. Thank you very much, uh, Fabio. Thanks a lot. Um, to all the participants, thank you for all the comments you're sharing. We'll take more uh, of your input on board, but I think that now it's time to, to get your um, input on uh, possible tips. So I kindly ask my colleague, Matteo, who is helping out with uh, managing the technical parts of the conversation to upload on screen the question. So um, according to the, um, let's say, uh, inspired by the, the four radical ideas, which Tom will remind you in a second, what uh, is your tip to make digital inclusion a reality? Please write it in the chat and uh, the first three will win a hard copy of the publication, which obviously you can also download uh, electronically. But um, uh, Tom, back to you for a second on the for radical ideas so that we can frame the conversation better. Thanks a lot. Uh, there is actually four different areas. So it's not, let's say, ideas as such, and they actually resonate with a lot of the ideas that Karin and, and Fabio already have uh, mentioned. And I'm also referring to the questions that our uh, participants have added. I think it was Kamal that mentions North versus South, and there are a lot of these kind of bipolarities in the domain, it's like offline versus online, and I think throughout the dialogue that we have been doing, it's looking at with a bit of a 360 degree view, even on basic notions of what do you mean by digital uh, literacy, so the first exercise was reimagining digital uh, literacy, and especially when in our case you look at it from a, a global perspective, has actually many different entry points apart from the standard definitions that we have. So look at it with, let's say, a wide angle. If we move towards the, the second angle to advance, let's say, the 360 degree inclusion uh, agenda, I would refer to a few remarks that Karin and also Fabio have done and also included, let's say, different dimensions, social, uh, environmental, and economic uh, dimensions. And it's quite important, specifically related also to the exclusion uh, agenda. I think in the summit, it was Professor uh, Ellen Hasper from the London School of Economics that said we need to look into more, she called it, ecological uh, models. It's the holistic view that both Fabio and Karin have mentioned in order not to leave anyone behind because one of the issues, and I think it was Kamal, he mentions their skills, there's access, there's infrastructure. One of the possible problems is that there are different disadvantages intersect together to be able to also amplify social inclusion. So we need to look at this kind of three-dimensional uh, view towards inclusion and also add few tips in this kind of uh, area. The third one, I think that's the most resonating one, the kind of human-centered approach, designing for humans, for users, people-oriented approach. If you look at the 42 tips, there are plenty of them that put basically the human at the center of the design stage, specifically to what Karin mentioned. It's about the design and delivery of these kind of sustainable learning solutions that we need to put that at the center. And the fourth one is about um, yeah, accelerating momentum. It's now really in uh, a stage, not only in terms of interest but in everything specifically if you look you know that's technology um, i think fabio mentioned 20 years ago if you look right now technology and the entire um, circumstances around has really an exponential growth uh, what we are now trying to do as training institutions as institutions that work on capacity building how can we keep up with the pace to also address this kind of exponential fast growth and, and change and that's where we also look into different models to, to answer so each one of these four areas has a lot of practical tips as i said we have 42 tips but the idea behind the 42 tips is 
to have a continuous conversation and maybe one day come up with 365 tips, maybe all thanks to you, so that we have almost a tip a day actually to put on our digital inclusion agenda for our organization and institutions that work in this particular area. So my question for you is, um, apart from the link that you have, you could download the publication is, do you see any other tips? I've seen some tips coming already in the chat box, but add a lot of other, because what are we going to do with some promising tips? Daria, I give the floor back to you. Thank you. It would be great to have a calendar with one tip a day. Um, so uh, I'd like to uh, give uh, visibility to the first ones we have um, received, uh, also because we made a promise, Tom, that we would send a hard copy. Um, so the first I've seen in the chat, actually, it's free. It's from Dejan. Thank you for, for uh, getting engaged in the conversation. Who's actually writing three affordable access and infrastructure, upgraded knowledge and skills, technological solutions to encompass all participants. And then I've seen another one later. Just give me one second because I'm scrolling down the chats, which was particularly interesting from Nicoletta Garimberti. On my humble opinion, it is a good choice using the libraries or the structures already in place and forcing their presence on the territory. So thanks to the first two uh, um, followers who have uh, taken on board uh, our proposed uh, challenge. How does these tips resonate with you, uh, Tom, Karin, Fabio? Mm -hmm. Well, there's definitely connection with, for example, the last one, uh, and Fabio remind me there was the community-oriented approach working with local territories in the case of, I think it was Brazil, uh, that we have this, our charismatic uh, figure out there that really connected, you know, say every digital inclusion with a really local community. That was the same approach of the Cibre Voluntarios that we have seen in, in Spain. And this is also, again, an invitation to go to the publication because there were about at least 50 different initiatives, organizations. So for the people in the chat that were asking, can we see some use cases of good example uh, of digital inclusion? And you will see it goes beyond digital inclusion. It goes back into the context where people live and work. It goes back into the communities that they're actually serving so that in the end, we're really not talking about digital inclusion anymore. So it really not has the, the big focus. These were also not called digital inclusion project. It was just maybe Fabio's inspiration, a kind of a transversal dimension to kick this projects off and by the end to say like look are they digital inclusive yes they are fantastically so even tips also i would say if we have practices or cases the idea is that this publication becomes a living conversation so it started from a small publication that fabio has written uh, a year ago i think it was a 10 pager it resulted now into a large book where more than 100 people participated and all the people from this conversation uh, as well Maybe the nice bonus was it's also accompanied by 42 uh, beautiful artworks coming from 92 different uh, countries. That was also a kind of competition around it. So that would be my quick link uh, to it. Maybe a last remark is we all know the divisions that it's, you know, it's you. I think the first tip was you have to look at skills. You have to look at infrastructure. You have to look at all these different dimensions. What we are looking for now is within these areas, for example, in digital skills, what would be your very concrete tips that you could basically give towards your colleague, towards your teacher, towards whoever is involved in the project that you're mentioning so that it's not really neither academic, neither technical, neither two things, but immediately digestible so that we can communicate and distribute it at a larger scale. And that's what we mean with accelerate the momentum, making it bigger and actually having a bigger impact or footprint on the entire digital inclusion discussion. Over to you. Thank you very much, um, Tom. And uh, while you were uh, speaking, we've been uh, receiving a number of other tips, such as uh, this one from Muhammad. If governments give free data coverage to their people, digital inclusion may become uh, a reality. And then we have David, coverage as much as possible, population for increasing digital literacy, upgrade digital technology and infrastructure and equipping with modest digital skills and competencies. And I had flagged 
some others um, in the conversation before. So I'll kindly ask for um, my colleague Mateo's help to please go through the chat and kindly uh, flag uh, in a private message to me the names of all of, well, of, of the followers who have kindly taken the, some time to uh, share a tip so that we can thank you before, thank them before we close the conversation and we'll ask you to send us your address in a private message on our social media accounts so that we can follow up and keep the promise of sharing a hard copy. Um, I'd like to uh, go back to um, Karin because I've also seen a uh, um, comments uh, addressing the ILO, actually uh, thanking the ILO, if I'm not mistaken. I hope I can find it uh, easily. If not, I'll ask Matteo to flag it. Um, in which uh, precisely a follower was saying that, echo, here, here it is, um, I'm also spreading the ILO and other international organizations work with my connections, which are available uh, just because across the world it is just because of uh, digital inclusion um karin focusing on on the future because we have 30 minutes to go to the end of this conversation what's in the pipeline from the ilo side to harness technology for good so that it impacts individuals and communities online and offline maybe anything which could raise the interest of this engaged uh, followers community that we're having today. Uh, thank you, Daria. So um, maybe I will flag a few initiatives that are in progress and some of them that are in, in the pipelines and that we are going to be focusing during uh, the year to come. So um, in the past months or even years, uh, uh, because it began before last year, um, we have uh, uh, implemented a, um, a skills profiling mobile application um, in different countries such as Lebanon and, and Kenya to enable uh, under the prospects partnership uh, forcibly displaced people to um, assess and communicate their skills to potential employers. So that's one um, example of uh, how we uh, try to leverage technology for good, as you said, Daria. Um, we are also um, um, carrying out uh, some different uh, digital assessment, uh, sorry, digital skills assessment uh, in different countries, uh, both on the supply and the demand side to make sure uh, we can recommend and orient policy making in that matter, not only in digital skills, but also on uh, TVET curricula uh, updates uh, to make sure that labor market uh, feeds or nurtures uh, supply and providers when, when, when it comes to design new curricula. Um, and this happens in South, Af uh, in South Africa and, and, and Kenya and Uganda among others. Um, we are also going to uh, increase our work this year on um, recognition and portability of skills. So end of last year, uh, we've uh, carried out a, a workshop under the Global uh, Skills Partnership for Migration um, on um, how to leverage uh, technologies such as blockchain uh, to enhance portability of skills for migrant workers. And this year and the years to come, we'd like to focus our attention on piloting some of those solutions in a defined uh, region and sector to make sure we are um, uh, able to say, yes, blockchain can be leveraged, uh, in which uh, uh, in which specific context, um, what um, which type of criteria should be looked at to make sure that uh, these type of solutions can can be uh, uh, efficiently implemented, um, and on yeah on the recognition and portability as well, um, we um, are studying at the moment together with UNICEF and Decent Job for Youth, um, uh, micro credential and digital badges and how they can also play a role in uh, digital inclusion in in a lifelong learning perspective. So 
that's uh, some of the things that uh, uh, the ILO has uh, in, 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 the, in the pipelines uh, in terms of uh, using or leveraging technology for good. Um, recommendations on um, sustainable use of technologies as well. So uh, some of, of the participants in the audience here were referring to um, community-based learning or centralizing resources, making the best of what is already being, uh, uh, or, or what already exists, or, or what was already produced uh, elsewhere. So I think this is something that we should be looking at as well, curating content, making sure that we are uh, using and maximizing initial investments when they are done. And, and so look at um, uh, uh, inclusive learning is also uh, looking at, you know, different ways to um, uh, centralize and, 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 and put together uh, uh, content when, when it's online um, uh, that enables, you know, or, or at least uh, prevent us from duplicating uh, and 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 uh, making a, a a not very sustainable use of, of technology in that regard. Yeah. So yeah, that's that's what's in in the pipelines for now, uh, Daria, and in, in our uh, in, in at the ILO. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Karin. Um, Fabio, uh, talking about uh, the activities uh, coordinated by the European Training Foundation, uh, the agency is currently running a campaign on digital skills for inclusion. Um, can you bring some examples of success from the countries in which the ETF operates? And then also, again, looking at the future, what is the road ahead and what will be the initiatives of the ETF in the field? Fabio. Yeah, as I was saying before, actually, we have a number of initiatives in the pipeline, which, of course, respond to the request and are running cooperation with the countries. So I was mentioning before a number of countries we work with, for example, by by promoting uh, also European Commission tools like Selfie to actually uh, foster st the strengthening of the ecosystem, the digital education ecosystem from the bottom, from the, with data coming from the bottom. So we are working with... Uh, a number, a number of, of countries there. Actually, uh, we are, as I was mentioning, trying to, to work also a bit more at the policy level, so a bit more top-down, trying to understand with the countries where they are planning to invest when it comes to digitalization and how we can help them to make this not only in an effective way, but also in, in, a, in an inclusive way. Then we're coming up with a couple of studies that we will be running this year. One study is on the relation between dig digitalization and digital inclusion in excellence centers, because, of course, we would like excellence centers to pave the way for more inclusive approaches to, to, towards lifelong learning. And finally, digital inclusion is one of the, I would say, common discuss discussion points of our new community of innovative educators that uh, we are supporting and we are through webinars and different discussions. But apart from these ETF branded activities, the thing that we would like to do actually was Tom was saying before is to keep the conversation going. So I think uh, this month uh, we are devoting it to digital skills for inclusion. But actually, uh, I think this month should be the launching month for this, uh, I would say, continuous campaign. Uh, that uh, that we need to, to I mean we need to keep uh, the flame alive. It's uh, it would be a pity, you know. I think to go back to normal, and uh, so we, we already discussed uh, with Tom, and now it would be great to have also the ILO in, involved in other organizations to make sure that somehow this conversation goes on. We have so many channels there. Social media is one, but also other webinars or maybe why not another summit or something like that. We can we should think of a way. I think to 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 keep it alive and to actually progress. Now we, move, we moved from four to forty-two. Now I'm not sure that from forty-two to three sixty-five will be feasible in one year, but it's uh, it's a nice uh, it's a nice I think uh, way to go. And then a final point I think a, a concept which was not uh, outspoken today is the one is one that is very close to our interest that is the one of critical digital literacy because of course building digital skills even you know super advanced digital skills is very important but it's also very important especially today 
to build critical digital literacy. Now, this is a, a it's not a new concept, but it's a concept that, that can really change the way people work with technology and learn with technology in a critical and I would say even more active and, as it was said, personalized way. Because if I understand why am I doing something with technology, then I, I typically do it in a more meaningful way for my personal life or for my learning or for my career. So I just wanted to point that uh, critical issue as well. Thanks. Yes, thank you very much, uh, Fabio, and indeed, um, let's keep the conversation going. Uh, we flagged uh, on screen uh, the link to the ETF's community open space, and we invite all of you who have been participating in this conversation to uh, go on that link, click, register, and connect uh, with a big community of learners. But uh, much more will happen um, also uh, thanks to uh, the, the, the great cooperation also between the ETF, ITCLO, and ILO. So, Tom, what is next on the agenda to continue all of this? Thanks, thanks a lot. Continuity and accelerate momentum was a key entry point. Um, and I think we don't want to be predictable. I, I, I would, um, what Fabio mentioned, maybe another summit, I would say, no, there are already too many summits going on. Every year there's an annual uh, event. So we would rather to try to create something new that could provide this continuity because the journey that we have been on, starting from a short paper towards a digital summit, towards a publication, maybe also towards different translations. I think we also need to be inventive on the methodological uh, side. Uh, one of the ideas that have been popped up was actually organize a 42-day challenge uh, where basically all the people or participants committed with this 42-day uh, challenge would commit, let's say, actions globally around these 42 uh, tips so that we also make them actionable uh, in this way and then also could report back on successful or learning uh, cases into a follow-up on, on the publication. So it's accelerating momentum, continuity, and the 42-day challenge could be a possibility. But if some of the listeners, organizations, or institutions have other creative ideas on how to go uh, about it, feel free to reach out to us, and we'll definitely take that into uh, account. So that would be uh, my, let's say, concluding remark on, on this element. I'm looking forward for to see creative proposals beyond the 42-day challenge that we have up so far. Thank you very much, Tom. And uh, indeed, what a better conclusion than uh, looking forward and uh, keeping up with a conversation. So with uh, the spotlight on the, the four um, radical points, reimagining digital literacy, advancing 250 degree inclusion, designing for humans and accelerating momentum, I'd like to thank the first five followers who have uh, um, uh, replied to our invite to share their tip for making digital inclusion a reality. Dejan Slatkowski, Nicoletta Galimberti, Pasquale Aiello, Muhammad Zubair Khan, and David Sitskaritze. Uh, thank you very much. Please do share a message uh, privately to the European Training Foundation social media accounts. And we'd be glad to uh, get in touch with you and to send you a hard copy of the publication, which was a follow-up of the Digital Inclusion Summit. And it's um, 3.59 Central European time. So I'd like to thank you all for having participated in this Learning Connects conversation on digital inclusion, sharing priorities, making it real. Thanks a lot to the distinguished speakers, Karine Sonigo, skills, skills digitalization specialist at the ILO. Thank you, Karine. Thank you. Thank you all. And thanks a lot to Tom Wambeke, Chief Learning Innovation at the ITC ILO. Thank you, Tom. You're welcome. And congratulations to the five people who will receive an analog book in digital time. So enjoy it. Absolutely, that makes it even more precious. And uh, thanks to Fabio Nashimbeni, Human Capital Development Expert at the European Training Foundation. Thank you very much, Fabio. Thank you very much, and thanks to all for the great ideas. Fantastic conversation. Thank you very much.
<laughs> Thanks a lot to all of you for following on Twitter, on YouTube, on LinkedIn, and on Facebook. And we see you soon for another Learning Connect conversation. Let's keep on keeping this, uh, maintaining this community alive. And thanks a lot to the ITC ILO communication team for joining forces on this uh, corporate effort. Thanks a lot and have a lovely afternoon, evening, morning, wherever you are. Bye.